22 years ago, Rwanda was on its knees. In the wake of the 1994 genocide, hundreds of thousands were dead. Many more were fleeing and government services were non-existent. But from economic growth rates of negative 11.4 in 1994 to positive 6.9 in 2015, the East African nation has proved both bookmakers and the world wrong. And now in 2016, the country is welcoming the world's top financial minds for the 2016 Economic Forum on Africa in the capital, Kigali. So where to next for this landlocked nation of less than 12 million people? And what lessons can the rest of Africa take away from Rwanda's economic miracle? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, 20 years after Rwanda's genocide, the country has been transformed into one of the most successful and competitive economies in Africa. CCTV's Robert Nagila traveled to the country to find out what lies behind Rwanda's economic success. From a fragile economic base destroyed during the 1994 genocide, Rwanda has risen from the ashes like the proverbial phoenix. Ranked high in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index and with a strong reputation for low corruption, Rwanda today boasts one of the strongest economic growth rates on the continent. Rwanda has undertaken a series of pro-investment policy reforms, making it an investment destination of choice. Part of their success can be attributed to the establishment in 2006 of a special economic zone. Henry Wei, the general manager of China Star, a construction company operating within the zone, says he's never regretted choosing Rwanda. The very important thing is about the rule of Rwanda, because when we came here, the, we know there are very good invest, uh, investment for the uh, foreign companies. And second is about the security. The security here is very good. The chief operating officer of Rwanda Development Board outlines the dividends the reform program has yielded. Rwanda is an attractive uh, investment destination for two reasons. Um, one, we have the most competitive uh, regulatory framework in Africa, uh, the second best uh, place to do business in Africa. And uh, we have done everything possible to facilitate investments. You can register within six hours your business. Uh, and um, we have also done reforms that are going beyond uh, doing business. For, for example, uh, we are one of the best places in Africa to be a woman, uh, the safest place to work at night, uh, and uh, the fourth most competitive uh, uh, government in terms of government efficiency. Finance Minister Clever Gatete puts the efficiency down to performance contracts for all civil servants. The performance contracts are really measuring ourselves uh, so that the whole system works in an efficient way. And also we have to make sure that we are accountable for every penny maximum out of every penny that is uh, invested in our own economy. Yeah, so there's, there has been quite, quite a lot in addition to the, uh, the normal ways of doing business. But Rwanda's economy isn't without its challenges. The private sector is still largely informal, and better infrastructure and lack of access to electricity are some of the major constraints to private investment. Robert Magello, CCTV, Kigali, Rwanda. Now, Rwanda's long-term development goals are defined in a strategy entitled Vision 2020. The strategy seeks to transform the country from a low-income, agricultural-based economy to a knowledge-based, service-oriented economy with a middle-income country status by 2020. We sat down with the country's Minister of Finance and Economic Planning, the Honorable Kleva Gatete, to find out how Rwanda plans to achieve their economic goals. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. I'll begin with what can the rest of Africa learn from Rwanda's economic rising? 
Uh, well, I don't know if that's the right question because we keep learning from each other. I don't think there is any country that has gone uh, through economic transformation uh, just dependent on uh, domestic way of uh, transforming the economies. Because as a growing economy, we're always interdependent uh, with each other. But I think what happened uh, here in Rwanda and what has been very, very instrumental in terms of driving our transformation is number one is leadership. Uh, a leadership that has a clear vision, a leadership that has a clear strategy, direction, a leadership that is looking at inclusive development. Not only the GDP growth, but also how that growth reflects in terms of uh, satisfying the basic needs of ordinary people, and where all the people are also engaged in the entire development process. So the leadership has been very uh, critical. Then number two, there has been so many innovations. We realize that actually uh, doing business as usual, uh, collecting revenues from taxes or development partners, uh, investing, uh, the classical way of uh, investing is not sufficient. So we have to make sure that we innovate uh, so that you can achieve more with less. Uh, and that's why there have been many, many examples of how we supplement our own budget, uh, even including the public works where we work for free but contributing as a community, but also uh, using different ways uh, that we have put in place to make sure that we can improve efficiency and also use our own culture, our own tradition, our own way uh, of doing things uh, to make sure that we can perform. And just how can Rwanda attain sustainable growth against a background of economic slowdown across the African continent? Yeah, of course, uh, uh, we, that's what exactly we are doing. Uh, we are realizing that actually the many shocks as an, an open economy, we are completely integrated and meaning that actually we have to do much more and in terms of diversifying. It's not only diversifying in terms of markets, which is very, very important. Traditional Rwandan's products are going to Europe. And now you can see most of it going to Asia, going to America, going to the Middle East, and also going to other African countries. But what we are also seeing in terms of diversifying uh, also is, is making sure that what we send outside is not just raw commodities, it's just a very addition. And that's why, uh, of course, if you see the commodities like minerals have been hard hit because of the low demand in China. Uh, and we've seen that actually for us to be able to export and get value for that man, uh, for the exports is to make, to make sure that we add value. But also to go beyond the traditional exports. We've been exporting minerals, the coffee, the tea, but now we find that actually what contributes to growth can be something else. We are now, for example, looking at the secondary cities. The cities, if they are well organized, if they are well invested and you put everything that's needed and is well connected, the uh, poor of growth uh, for our own economies. But also we, we see that in terms of diversification, we want to take the entire region as a buffer, meaning that actually regional integration becomes a very, very important aspect for all of us. With that uh, uh, well region that is well integrated, for a population that is now more than 160 uh, a million people of East African community region, including South Sudan, uh, this becomes a big market. If it was well interconnected, if there's a free movement of people, if the financial systems are well connected, the capital market are well connected, this becomes a big market for us. Now, the World Economic Forum is coming to Rwanda. Just how can the country use this opportunity to showcase what it has to offer investors? Yeah, thank you very much. The Economic, World Economic Forum indeed taking place here on the 11th to 13th is actually for the whole of Africa, including Rwanda. And here Rwanda also we look at it within the context of the region. We've been working together as a team. And here we showcase exactly uh, what we are able to do, what we have done. Uh, one is the tourism sector, which you mentioned the service sector, and tourism becoming a, a big part of it. And here we've been actually we have introduced a system uh, they call it MICE, which is uh, really all the meetings and the conferences uh, here being uh, really trying to see what makes them, right from the airport and the airline to the hotels, to the transport system, to the IT, to the services and other things. The efficiency of how things are done uh, to make sure that we can continuously improve in terms of serving our clients uh, as, as a country that is uh, looking forward to becoming a conference center 
uh, and also, of course, in addition to the tourism and other kind of activities that uh, serve them. But we want to make sure that all the services are there. From the airport, the way you are cleared, because you don't need a visa, you only get a visa at the airport from anywhere in Afri on the African continent. And then when you enter any means of transport, then you have the fastest uh, technology that you can have, the 4G, in any bus, in any truck, in any uh, taxi uh, that you can get. In the hotel, you get the super services uh, that, you, that you can get. And that is really something that we want to make sure that uh, the tourism side uh, is, is really uh, profiled. But also Rwanda has invested heavily, as you mentioned, the service sector. Our vision is to become a middle income country, but also to become a service sector aid with technology, with IT becoming a, a very critical element. We've been investing in it since, since the year 2000, and now it is starting to uh, yield really uh, uh, significant uh, uh, benefits. So now having uh, our resources being uh, uh, transformed by digital becomes very, very critical. We want to show our, uh, digi uh, our digital village, if you want to call it a special economic zone, where we have over 60 hectares of land, where we have all the various institutions. The Carnegie Mellon University is there. Uh, the African Institute of Mathematics and Science is going to be located there. Other four centers of excellence will be there in almost all other areas. We are also getting the young Rwandan innovators also in that area. We are establishing a fund, innovation is fund that is going to, to help in terms of driving it. We are encouraging, and there are some companies that have already started, like Positivo, the IT companies to, trying to produce from here. So we are going to put the whole package together and say, this can work for Africa. You know, if it has worked elsewhere, it can work for Rwanda because you have the company for production, you have the IT infrastructure, you have the research and technology, you have the innovation, you have everything. So it can work in Africa and be able to help other sectors, from agriculture to industry to anything. And that's what we want to make sure that really this one comes very, very clearly, that technology can uh, actually become a very, very big engine of economic transformation. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, I'll be joined by expert guests to help make more sense of Rwanda's economic miracle. To stay with us. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now to help further unpack Rwanda's miraculous economic transformation, I have expert guests standing by in Nairobi, Professor Michael Shege, advisor of the Kenyan Ministry of Planning and National Development. In Beijing, Ambassador Xu San. He's China's former ambassador to Rwanda and Eritrea. And with me here in Thai Commissioner to Kenya, Ambassador James Kimonyo. Thank you all for joining in this conversation. Professor Shege, I'll start off with you on, on this. Rwanda's economic growth just under 8% over the last couple of years. It is one of the world's fastest growing economies today. That turnaround having been achieved since 1994. What do you attribute to the social and economic progress in the last 20 years? Good leadership more than anything else. The leadership of President uh, Paul Kagame, uh, the genocide, and clear focus about the direction he wanted to take the country and technocratic staff around him who have been responsible for crafting the Vision 2030, the medium term plans, and a clear focus on how to do things. But more importantly for Rwanda, near total absence of corruption which plagues most African countries and most developing countries, and efficiency in public administration. Those are the factors that explain why Rwanda is where it is. Ambassador Kimonya, you can shed light uh, on this for us. What have been the government strategies that have taken that economy from negative growth to, uh, at some point, 13%? And how has it been guiding that economy through all those changes? Let me say that uh, as Rwandans, we are very proud of what we have done in terms of uh, transforming the country. I should say maybe we are not very happy because we still want to do more. Uh, to transform our country. But I understand why people call it a, a miracle transformation. It's because we really started from a very, very low base. There was nothing. There was nothing left after the genocide. We had to put together pieces to be able to build this country. And as the professor mentioned, uh, our president, who led the revolution, the liberation, uh, had to deal with first and foremost security of the country and at the same time deal with the reconciliation because our society had been divided for many, many years. And from that point, we had to draw a roadmap on how then we transform the country. Because after we 
secured the country, it's peaceful, and people are going into the process of reconciliation. What do we do then to make sure the people improve their livelihoods? And then we came up with the vision 2020, six years later, after the genocide, which has different pillars that has been, have been guiding us in terms of what we have achieved in the last 22 years. We're going to look at your roadmap in just a moment, but I want sure. to get Ambassador Shu's experience here because you have been a former ambassador to Rwanda. In your view, though, what makes Rwanda a success story? I think the most important thing is that they find their own homegrown solutions. I think that this is the main reason for its success. Although it uh, tried to learn some others, uh, but however, they would adapt these uh, experience of the foreign countries to the uh, exactly realities of the Luanda itself. And uh, also, I think they are they are using a very good uh, uh, the uh, vehicle that is. Uh, they're using the uh, Kian Luanda historical heritage or or the uh, tradition, so that to make uh, everybody in a country understand what they are going to do. So it is uh, very easy for them to get the. Uh, consensus. Right. Uh, Ambassador Kimonio, uh, Ambassador Shu has talked about these homegrown solutions that uh, Rwanda has undertaken. What are those homegrown innovations? Why did Rwanda um, undertake homegrown solutions as, as opposed to uh, following in the developmental models of other African countries? You know, in the aftermath of genocide, we are faced with enormous challenges in many, many different ways. Just starting with uh, what the Ambassador mentioned, in terms of justice. After the genocide, after losing one million people, we had a lot of perpetrators who participated in the genocide. And the class, class court system that was supposed to deliver justice for the victims and the perpetrators was very, very slow. It was actually estimated that if you were to deal with more than 200,000 perpetrators, it was going to take more than 200 years to deal with them in a, a usual classic conventional court system. Then the Gachacha court came into existence because that is a system that u was used by Rwandese to deal with, you know, handle disputes in terms of uh, conflict resolution. And this system came into existence and we put in place laws to govern it. And in that process we were able to deliver justice to actually to, to try more than 1 million point two, you know, perpetrators of genocide or people who participated in genocide. Otherwise, if without that solution, we are not going to be able to reconcile people and deliver justice to the victims, but at the same time, deliver justice to the perpetrators. So that's one, one, one solution. But we have had other things. For instance, when we talk about, maybe we'll talk about later, in terms of economic uh, uh, transformation. Right. The Umuganda, which is a community, you know, uh, you know uh, participation, where, where people participate every end of the month, to do a community work in terms of building bridges, roads, and doing other things that they that cost a lot of money from the government. So we have adopted some of these solutions to be able to address challenges that would otherwise take many, many years to be able to, to be addressed by, by the usual system in terms of financing, in terms of legal processes. So I think uh, some of these solutions, the Abunzi, which is uh, the community, you know, elders who sit down and resolve conflicts instead of going to the court process. We have done a lot of those things to be able to address with, uh, with uh, to address some of those challenges. For instance, the Ubudehe, which is uh, a contribution that's done by the community to support people who are poor in their communities, which will really take time for these people to get any, uh, you know, whatever loan from the bank or any support right. from the government. The people do it from their own communities to help people who are poor to be able to get out of poverty. Professor Shegel, I want to draw you in though, uh, in terms of uh, the economic models that uh, Rwanda has been pursuing. And just in 2005, it was uh, ranked the first globally in terms of uh, using ICT. It has also been ranked as the third in Africa in terms of its report on the ease of doing uh, a business. What stands out for you, though, Professor Shege, in terms of uh, economic or business reforms that Rwanda has undertaken? What stands out for you as being one of the biggest uh, single innovations that has had huge impact? Well, Rwanda, Rwanda today has got the best doing business record in all of Africa, and it competes with some of the most advanced countries in Africa. They have learned uh, that if you really want to attract business, You've got to be, first of all, efficient in, t in the number of days it takes to register a company, which in Rwanda is just a matter of a few days. 
Uh, you don't bribe people to connect electricity or water or to process licenses and that sort of thing. All of that is done in record time. And they've used ICT to facilitate this, done deliberately. Clearly, the model here is that of Southeast Asian countries. Make it easy for people to do business. Your own people to start with, but also foreigners coming to your country to do business. That is why they rank so well. And I believe also efficiency in the public sector so that people get services from government when it is due and when, they, when it's wanted. In, in a way, you look at the indicators of how long it takes to deliver services to the people, and Rwanda ranks very well in that, in that, in that respect. Ambassador Kimonyo, such a short time, but so much has been achieved. How have you done it? I think what the government did was to undertake a lot of reforms in terms of removing especially non-tariff barriers because it will cost nothing to reduce the time it takes for someone to register a company by just employing ICT as the professor mentioned but also reducing bureaucracy within the system. It is for this reason that the government decided to create what we call one development board whereby an investor comes in instead of running up and down going to different institutions you come to RDB and then you present you, you, your proposal then the registration and all the in the same building by the people who represent the government from different institutions and then it takes a short time for you to, to, to register and also there are other things that we have done in terms of doing reforms in terms of land registry in terms of uh, work permits in terms of visas that will make easier for you to come in Rwanda and do business and I think what is most important is that you do it but also uh, allow a situation where all the institutions buy into that idea of facilitating all the investors to make sure that when the, it is easily converted into actual investment. All right. Uh, Ambassador Shu, though, I in terms of boosting investor confidence and uh, in terms of attracting uh, investment into Rwanda, as you look at the reforms that Rwanda has undertaken and those homegrown solutions, are there issues that you feel African countries can borrow from Rwanda? I think at least uh, all the countries, including China, could learn from uh, Rwanda example is that uh, you have to focus on improvement of or what we call it a social economic development of your own nation and uh, try to have this uh, strong commitment and uh, try to include all the uh, all the uh, citizens to uh, participate it. And another uh, strong point I think we can learn is that uh, you have to constantly adjust your uh, existing policies so that you can keep in pace with the times. All right. Uh I want to come back to um, uh, one of your uh, economic models that you're following. And uh, Rwanda has mentioned previously that uh, it wants to be the Singapore mm -hmm. of Africa. And, and, and of course, uh, Rwanda has also been following uh, the development of the Southeast Asian countries. Which models are you following? What are you borrowing from the Southeast mm -hmm. Asian economies? Well, I, I should say that uh, well, we are not trying to be the Singapore of Africa. We are trying to get where we want to get in terms of uh, building our country. But uh, I, uh, I should say that uh, in the aftermath uh, of genocide and faced with all these challenges, we had to figure out which type of economic model that we were going to follow. And then we had to buy from best practices around the world, particularly in Asia, Singapore inclusive, Mauritius also, and other countries, to be able to come up with a blend of one of the economic models that is going to make sure that we go, we get to where we want to get. Because remember, it has been proven that the higher forms of growth are not necessarily based on natural resources. There are other forms of growth, especially investing in human capital. And I think that's why you say Rwanda is going to be uh, a knowledge-based economy. And therefore, the country has, uh, the government has decided to invest heavily into human capital development. Ambassador Shu, are there models, though, are there opportunities that uh, between Rwanda and China now that China's economy is uh, changing from uh, moving from manufacturing to a services and consumer, a, p a private sector-led economy? Are there opportunities here for Rwanda? I think uh, there are a lot, and also there are also opportunities for the uh, Chinese enterprises either to uh, develop themselves abroad or 
learn some good examples from uh, abroad as well. But and uh, these fields, I think, uh, either in the uh, infrastructure, agriculture, and uh, manufacture, and I, there are a lot. Mm -hmm. But however, the uh, any enterprises from outside, including the uh, Chinese one, they should not go into Luanda with the uh, only one plan. They thought it is to the need because you have to find out what really need on the ground and you have to align your own things with the uh, development plan of the Luanda. Rwanda is going to be hosting the World Economic Forum. What's the significance of that for you? I think uh, this comes uh, at the time uh, when we all need to sit together and see how we can revolutionize our economies through uh, technologies. And, and, and I think the theme is, uh, is very clear in terms of how we are going to use ICT and technology to be able to transform the African economy and the global economy. And so Rwanda will be very placed in a very good position to, to be able to share our own experience in terms of how we invested in ICT and how this has really you know, uh, improved our economy and how it has made Rwanda to be what it is today. And so that will be a very good platform for, for Rwandans, for, for the continent and for the world to share our own experiences and figure out what we're going to do as the next phase to be able to transform the economy of our country, the continent and the, the world over. Professor Shege, you have the final word on this. What next for Rwanda? Well, if you look at the Rwanda Vision 2020, the, the idea clearly uh, is to, to make a jump from a predominantly agricultural country to one in which is private sector driven but with emphasis on the service sector, overlapping uh, manufacturing. That is why ICT, the service sector, knowledge-based economy is being emphasized in that country. I think Rwanda's biggest drawback is being landlocked. And one must hope that the standard gate railway will get to Kigali sooner than later, as well as the oil pipeline, so that the transit time from Kigali for goods, Kigali to Mombasa or Dar es Salaam, or whatever it may be, will be a lot shorter and less costly than it is at the moment. Uh, we wait to see how a service-based economy is going to to, to prosper in that country. But let us also not forget that Rwanda is a member of the East African community now, and a very active member at that. So what is going to happen in future in Rwanda will depend on the market in East Africa, which is now available to Rwanda, which wasn't the case before, and especially in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And uh, we hope that uh, Rwanda's participation in the East African economy will help grow the Rwandan economy, as well as Rwanda's targeting of the in global market. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your insights. And that's all we have time for this week. But thanks to my guests for their insights. In Nairobi, Professor Michael Shege, he's an advisor at the Kenyan Ministry of Planning and National Development. In Beijing, Ambassador Xu San, he's China's former ambassador to Rwanda and Eritrea. And with me here in studio is Rwanda's High Commissioner to Kenya, Ambassador James Kimonyo. Remember, you can join the conversation online through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. And do join us again next week for another edition of Africa. Goodbye.